Hello, everyone. Um, um, yeah, it's only time. Oh, oh, this is the whole slide. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes, this is the right one. Yes. Yes. Hello, everyone. So um, I am Tejun and Johannes. Uh, we are from Facebook. Um, and we want to talk about resource control at Facebook. So I want to start with this graph. Um, um, so imagine a web server, right? Uh, a Facebook web server, um, which is running, like, filled up to the brim, right? It, it's saturated in terms of CPU, in terms of memory, in terms of disk. It has hard disk, too. So um, it's really filled up to the brim, right? If you imagine a web server like that in a fleet like Facebook, there's a lot of management service going on, right? There's Chef running, you know, uh, which also uh, runs Yum uh, from time to time, and you know, cron jobs, you know, all the monitoring. So there's a lot of infrastructure pieces going on in the system, and um, and imagine like one of those, you know, support services slowly leaking memory, let's say 10 megabyte per second. Right? You don't really notice at first, but it's going to add up pretty soon, and you know, you're going to see problems. And um, if you think about, you know, like, um, let's say you run a chef, and somebody wrote a, you know, a, a, a wrong script, and that's kind of leaking memory. Um, and it's not really an essential part of the system. You want it running, but you don't want your website to go down because of that. Um, so it'd be really nice if you can protect your main workload, uh, the web server, from those kind of things. So if you look at the uh, purple line, um, that's the, 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 the y-axis is RPS, requests per second, how many pro uh, requests is processing. Um, that's before um, what you know, we, we uh, did what we did. Um, so that red marker, 10 megabyte per second growth on both, means that uh, we started a memory leak intentionally uh, in, in one of those support services. And memory grows up, and your memory runs out, and uh, whole machine crashes down, right? Um, RPS drops, you know, machine is thrashing now, it cannot really do anything else. And eventually, it, it, you know, after like half an hour, the machine gets rebooted, and then it recovers, right? That, that's like a 40 minute recovery process. Um, if, you know, if this is happening at a wide scale, right? Let's say, you know, you somebody deployed the chef uh, recipe, which it did that at the same time, that is taking down Facebook, right? I mean, that's the whole site going down. Um, and the green line is what we did. Green line is a resource uh, control. So we use that for resource protection and resource uh, control kicking in. And while the RPS drops a bit, right, it holds on. And, and we did that three times, and the system you know, generally survives pretty well. You know, there's minor annoyance. There's you know, people experiencing um, some latencies in, in their you know, use of Facebook, and some uncles getting paged. And that's about it. It's not a major event. So this, is, this uh, presentation is about you know, uh, going from purple to green, you know, how we did that. So um, we are a resource control group or team uh, at Facebook. And this is our uh, motto or you know, our mission statement, world conserving full OS resource isolation. So it's a, a bit of world salad, right? So um, let's unpack that. So the first thing, world conserving, right? World conserving means that we want to use the machine if there's work to do, right? We don't want to put you know, uh, in resource restrictions in a way which limits the overall utilization of the machine, right? Because that's wasteful. We want control, but we, you know, we don't want to be expensive doing it. The second part, full OS, is that um, if you imagine using a VM uh, for resource isolation, it's a lot easier, right? I mean, you hard assign memory, you hard assign some disk uh, capacity, um, you, you can pin CPUs. Um, Resource control-wise, it's almost trivial. You can easily do that. But then you lose all the integration with the host system, right? Um, uh, you, you lose access to files on the host uh, system. You, know, um, you can have other workarounds, but you know, literally. Um, and, and, or you can you know, restrict IOs to direct IOs, right? That also makes the problem easier if you bypass memory management page cache. But these things all added, adds up to operational complexity. And so what we wanted to do was keeping um, to make uh, resource control transparent to the rest of the system. 
meaning that applications and users can keep doing whatever they want, they have been doing, and what they whatever they want to do. And we want to layer resource control on top so that it just works uh, transparently, right? You have you're the same system, and you lay uh, lay over lay. Um, you put uh, resource control on top of it, and it just works the same, except for the added resource control. That's what you want it to do. So um, if you think about like doing that, like imagine that you know we never had that, we never had, and, um, and we needed a project. We wanted a project which is simple, and which can, we can demonstrate that this is useful, and this is, you know, this, this is workable. So uh, we chose a project called Epitax. So Epitax means that um, in, in, inside Facebook, that the tax that every machine has to pay to be part of the fleet, right? All the management and all the monitoring overhead that we have to pay, that's called, that part is called Epitax. And sometimes, as I uh, you know, said in the uh, first slide, like the tax part misbehaves and brings down the system. So our initial project was, you know, it'd be great if you can protect the main workload from the tax part. So that was Epitax, um, the, the name of the project. It became the name of the project. And as you can see from the two part, you know, it's like Epitax 2, uh, the first attempt just failed miserably, right? I mean, we, um, I, uh, we did something we thought would be effective, and it just made the system more, more fragile, more brittle. You know, now nobody was happy. So we had to go back to a drawing board and, um, you know, re rethink everything. And so what was so challenging about it? I mean, it doesn't sound that difficult, right? I mean, how, how hard uh, can that be? And, and the challenges were uh, in almost all areas. Um, uh, yes, <laughs> almost all areas. And uh, the f f first was that... Um, Memory that high and max um, is the, or like in C group one terms, right? That'd be memory limit in bytes, um, would be the natural thing that people would think about when think about controlling memory distribution. What they do is that you know it's saying that you can only have this amount of money, right? Uh, not money, memory. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know memory is money. So um, so like what we, how we can do it for AP tax would be we can put a limit. Or for support services, right? You guys can only use, say, you know, four gigabytes or six gigabytes. You can use no more. Um, that didn't really work that well because if you think about it, right? If you put in restrictions, that means that you are lowering overall utilization, right? When uh, support services has to have more memory to run reliably, if you put in this uh, artificial uh, lim uh, limitation, it can't. And the thing is that uh, on systems which are running up to the brim, a lot of resources are nominally oversubscribed, and it's you know in in uh, temporary terms. Um, so they have to be able to go over like these artificial limits sometimes. So this didn't really work. So uh, the moment we put in um, these artificial limits, the systems started failing more, um, and we had to like you know inch up the limit to the point where it is not meaningful. So it just, you know, we couldn't lower utilization to protect the workload because the system is already too busy. Um, the other part was that uh, kernel um didn't really work well. Um, the, the main reason for, for that is that kernel um kicks in only when the kernel thinks that the kernel is in trouble, right? If the kernel cannot make forward progress, then umkiller kicks in and, you know, kills something to make forward progress. It doesn't really know or really care about whether your workload, you know, your application is running fine or running well. It doesn't know about that. Um, so the system can easily enter a state where the kernel is thinking, eh, everything is fine, while the application is thrashing for 20 minutes. That's what you saw in the first slide, too. That's why the recovery takes 30 minutes, because for, you know, 20 minutes of that time, the kernel is not doing anything. It's thinking, oh, all is fine. So that was another uh, challenge that we met uh, in terms of memory uh, control. And um, IO control, IO was, uh, IO was um, hard too, um, maybe even more difficult. Um, the first one is that we didn't have a good IO controller to use. Uh, CFQ um, didn't really work well with SSDs, and even on uh, hard drives, we had a lot of issues in the production, so we couldn't really use that. Um, and um, and the, uh, there's another controller called uh, IO Throttle, 
But I mean, that's, that's the same thing, right? That's, uh, that uses uh, memory uh, IO dot high end Mac, uh, IO dot max. Um, so it limits the total amount of IO can, which can be done. And you know, the same story. You cannot limit and survive. And um, another thing is that you know, the BPS and, and IOPS is what IO dot max uses. And if they're just not a good measure of uh, IO capacity, right? I mean, it's just really difficult to find a good configuration with those two parameters because they don't really reflect uh, how expensive these IO streams are to the device. And another issue that we met was that um, um, that we were not accounting the IO controller, the C group uh, IO controller part was not accounting um, file system metadata operations and swap operations. We'll, we'll get to swap, but you kind of need swap, especially uh, with SSDs. It just gets, makes more and more sense. And um, we were not accounting them properly, so we were charging them to the root C group, like to the system, and that caused a lot of uh, power conversion issues. And power convergence. Um, so we, um, so for, for the past couple of years, we have been really working hard at this problem. And you know, earlier this year, uh, we thought that we, we now nailed the, we thought we nailed the memory controller, we nailed the IO controller, it seems to be working. And then we tried to put them together and found out that nothing works, nothing still works. And the main reason for that was that there are a lot of like, major priority inversions in the system. Uh, for example, um, well, so the kernel basically assumes that everything in the system can make forward progress. Otherwise, it locks up. I mean, so if you like one process runs out of memory, right? What, what the kernel's basic assumption is that I got to make that unstuck. Otherwise, the whole system is going to, you know, stay still. So it throws everything, you know, your, you know, uh, priority configurations or whatever out of the window and tries to reclaim memory as hard as it can. It's just every other configuration becomes meaningless. Um, but I mean, if you take that approach, to you know, resource uh, control inside the system, right? Doesn't really work because we want to be able to slow down a part of system really badly while maintaining health of the you know a more important part of the system. So the kernel can no longer operate in a way which assumes that everything has to make progress, right? I mean, something is going to make a lot faster progress than some other things. And so this uh, creeps up in, in uh, a lot of areas, but usually uh, around file system and um, I/O operations. So, for for example, uh, ext4 um, it can be fixed, but uh, ext4 uh, in in the data journal mode, um, the, the default operation mode, uh, can create uh, hard data dependency through its journal. So, like a high priority C group would have to wait um, for a lower priority IOs to finish before making progress. You, know, you cannot use that and you know, get anywhere. Um, and the, the, the uh, file system metadata, swap IO, yeah, those things are the same, right? I mean, low, high priority, you need to make the distinctions, otherwise low priority can you know, completely mess up high priority uh, performance and latency. Um, there's MFSM, MFSM is another interesting one. So MFSM is something which protects a, a process structure, like a memory layout of a process. And one really like, interesting part is that when you do PS, right, um, the information, the command line comes from inside the memory, me the memory of that process, right? So when you do PS, it has to go inside the memory space of the target uh, process and read that you know, command line argument from there. And so that requires grabbing something called MFSM. It's a, a, a read-wise semaphore. And um, it is also a major source of uh, uh, priority inversion because sometimes you end up issuing IOs while holding it. So if a low priority IO holds it, issues an IDO, waits for low priority IO, and high priority comes in and runs PS, then it gets stuck and the whole system gets stuck with it. So it doesn't work. So those are uh, a lot of those challenges. And there are a lot of others too, but those are the big ones. So yeah. Um, uh
works now, right? Okay. So, uh, yeah, what do we do about all these things? Um, there's a whole laundry list of problems. So, um, um, first, uh, first thing we started out with uh, was to tackle the memory controller because that was the first thing we configured in the first place. Um, and like TJ mentioned, we had to completely move away from hard partitioning. The you get this, you get that. It just doesn't work. Um, and instead, switch to um, prioritizing instead the thing that has higher uh, importance. Um, and the advantage of doing this uh, when you prioritize instead of partition is that if the higher priority thing is not running, um, the lower priority thing can just take all the resources it, it needs. Um, and um, by definition, that's just a lot more forgiving to configure um, because the worst that can happen is there's too much competition. And that's there are no artificial um kills, there's no artificial crashes or anything like this. Um, if the configuration doesn't uh, fully work, we can just adjust it and detect it while it's running. Um, so for memory, the way this looked like, we implemented something called memory low and memory dot min, um, which um, memory low is the primary thing that we use. So instead of uh, limiting something, you just say um, the main workload gets this much memory. Um, and uh, if it needs, if it wants more, it has to just compete with the with everything else that's running. But it uh, it's a it's a competition between different jobs, and the higher part one gets a leg up in that competition. Um, so, um, so memory low this set, um, is a best effort thing. So what we say is, um, unless there's severe memory pressure, the main workload gets more memory um, than everything else. Um, and then if we're about to run uh, out of memory and are threatened to bring down the entire machine, that's when we uh, violate that guarantee and just go, okay, let's just make it work and don't crash. Um, and then we also implement a memory min, um, which is for certain jobs where we would actually prefer an um kill rather than letting an application not work. For example, SSH, because if the machine doesn't respond to SSH, it gets rebooted forcibly. So we'd rather kill something else than let SSH run out of memory. Um, so um, that's what we did for memory. Um, then we also uh, kind of had no insight into how well our configuration was working. If you have multiple jobs sharing a machine, um, we actually didn't really know or weren't able to tell how much is the sharing of a host impacting the throughput and the latency of individual jobs. Like the, um, the kernel has a bunch of um, uh, statistics and counters like the page fault rate and um, reclaim activity from which you could tell, okay, there's maybe a little bit of struggle in that workload, um, but it doesn't tell you how much longer does your, do your operation if you're running shared versus if you have the whole host to yourself. And uh, literally the only thing you could do would be to have the application or the workload run on a machine on its own first to establish a baseline performance and go like, okay, this is what the workload could do if it had the, entire, um, the entirety of the resource available. And then you put it into a shared environment uh, and compare it to that baseline, right? Um, now, that's extremely cumbersome. It's also par uh, almost impossible for a lot of our workloads because they do change all the time. Um, we cannot really say this workload is always needing this much, this much resources because our user activity changes. Um, right now, the US is waking up, so the workload is gonna increase on our web servers and stuff like that. Um, so that doesn't really work. And even if it did, um, the only thing it tells you, this workload is now taking, taking longer to run if it's in a shared environment, but you cannot really tell the bottleneck is there, right? You can tell, okay, this now took, there's some latency here, this took longer to complete but you only know the time, you don't really know um, why. Um, so uh, this is where a thing called PSI comes, uh, which is a, uh, a feature we developed for the Linux scheduler. And what it does is um, it, it annotates all the points in the kernel where we have events that are associated with a, a lack of resource. So if, you, if the kernel enters um, uh, page reclaim, for example, we know we ran out of memory and we have to do some work um, that is not balancing the workload, but just kind of um, making up for the lack of memory. Uh, there are other events like um, you're waiting for um, 
a busy CPU to become available. You're trying to run, everything is busy, so you kind of have to wait. Um, so what PSI does is it annotates all these events and then aggregates um, what, what it's measuring um, into a share of total wall time or real time. So it gives you a percentage, so between zero and uh, 100%, that tells you um, how much of your overall runtime is the workload not productive because of a lack of resources. So if it, for example, reports 20% uh, uh, memory pressure, that means during 20% of, of the time um, that's elapsing, you're not actually doing work. You're just waiting for, you're waiting for page faults to come back of, of recently evicted pages. You're waiting for page reclaim. Um, and um, that gives you a measure of how much product productivity you're actually losing, and it tells you um, what resource um, is the culprit for that. Um, so the whole thing uh, works against the live system, so we don't have to do control runs or anything. Um, so if we have a, a setup with multiple shared workloads, we can tell for every single workload at any given time if it's losing time right now on contended resources. Um, so um, that obviously makes it a lot easier to, con uh, to configure our uh, um, resource control configuration because we can instantly tell this thing has too little memory. Uh, this is waiting on CPU more than it should. Um, and so this helped a lot in getting the basic uh, configuration right. Um, and um, we can also use something um, that I would call um, being functionally out of a resource. So this is kind of tricky. Um, as TJ mentioned before, um, when the kernel um killer kicks in, that's a very specific event, which is you're trying to allocate a, a page, a piece of memory, and it tries to reclaim, and it fails, and it cannot allocate the single piece of memory. That's when the kernel goes, you're out of memory. But the thing is, um, even if you're at lower levels of memory pressure where this is not happening yet, you might already be functionally out of memory because you're spending like 60% of the time waiting for memory. So you're losing pretty much most of your production ca uh, capacity, but the kernel um killer is like, well, you're still making progress. Um, so what this helps do, uh, um, um, what this helps with is um, with detecting when you're functionally uh, out, of, out of a resource. And it goes for uh, CPU, it goes for memory, it goes for IO. And, um, we can use this for uh, several things. So one thing we did was uh, for load shedding, where you have um, a service that would just go like, um, the latencies are now too high for every single uh, request, and uh, so I'm going to stop accepting requests and let some other machine handle it in order to avoid shedding and uh, completely rebooting or hanging for a while. Um, the other thing we do is, um, um, we have uh, we developed um, an enforcer of that. Um, this is a, a project called UMD. Um, it started kind of out as a as a small Python script that would just go if you're waiting more than X percent for uh, on memory, uh, I'm going to kill something. Now in the meantime, it's kind of developed into um, into a much bigger thing. Um, Daniel's here too. He's going to have a uh, talk about that later, and it really does out of resource management for everything. It, it can monitor IO, it can memory, uh, monitor memory health, it can do all these things. Um, so, so um, the thing this uh, does is, um, as CJ mentioned before, uh, the kernel um killer doesn't kick in uh, for a long time, so um, it's not really helpful in managing our workload health. And the other thing is, if it does kick in, um, it, it, the only thing it tries to do is keep the kernel running, so it just picks the biggest task in the system and just shoots it in the head. And now the thing is, we, our, our jobs are complicated, right? They're, they're multi-process things, um, and um, they also have different priorities. And the kernel killer has no understanding, right? It just shoots something and then moves on. And when this happens, we actually have no idea what state we're in. So um, we had a couple of, um, a couple of services that um, could just not continue if the kernel um killer kicks in. So they basically enabled um, uh, uh, panic on um and just had to reboot. It's like if something died, I don't know wh uh, what died. I, I'm the entire machine. Um, 
so this is where UMD kicks in. Uh, um, the two things it does, first, um, this dis distinction between when the kernel thinks you're out of memory and when we think we're functionally out of memory or functionally out of a resource where our production capacity is no longer adequate. Um, that's completely workload dependent, right? Some workloads might be fine, they're waiting 20% on memory. Some workloads say, I have a little bit more latency, I can't, this is not acceptable anymore, my SLAs are not met. Um, so this is what you can configure uh, UMD to do. First, that you configure it, what is my trigger point here? What is, the ex what is my tolerance level for health? And um, if that's not met, then go do the other thing, which is, kill something important. And again, something important is completely dependent on the, on the system, it's dependent on the workload. Um, and what that something is, is also dependent on, is that a single process or is this an entire C group you want to ta uh, have taken out? Um, so uh, people try to do kind of policy like this inside the kernel f uh, over the years, uh, repeated, just doesn't really work uh, to convey all this knowledge, convey what quality of service is to the kernel to convey what workloads are. And um, that's why UMD sits in user space, because you, you can just configure that much easier. Um, now, for the uh, IO controller, um, uh, as TJ mentioned, we, we, don't re uh, we cannot really know the cost of IO. So if you, you can have a couple of IOPS already um, completely filling up the device, or you could have um, um, a couple of megabytes if, if it's really seeky and it's a lot of IOPS also kind of fully utilized device. So it's really hard to say in advance how much is this going to cost. For SSDs you might have a, a simple write and all of a sudden the garbage collection run goes off, right? So it, it's hard to predict. Um, so instead of trying to um, use these metrics like IOPS and, and, and bytes per second and all that stuff, um, what we do is um, we track completion latency. So every time you submit an IO request, we just um, uh, monitor how long it takes to complete. And, and then you can configure per C group what your tolerance level is, right? So um, you can say, if my IOs take longer than 50 milliseconds, for example, then throttle everything that has a lower guarantee. So if there's somebody else that has a 70 milliseconds guarantee, that thing's getting get throttled. Every time it tries to submit IO or uh, memory, that thing has got to wait. Um, so again, this is uh, work conserving. If the high, high priority thing is not running, then the low priority thing can just like, use the device uh, however it wants. Um, and that works uh, for both uh, hard disk and SSDs. Um, um, the other thing the uh, IO controller does that, uh, that we wrote is um, it supports uh, th um, things like, uh, teacher mentioned, the um, uh, metadata, sh uh, uh, metadata IO, which is shared between, um, between all C groups, and also something like swap. Because if, you, um, if you're doing p uh, memory reclaim and you want to allocate some memory and you have to reclaim something, you're deciding, I need to swap out some memory, that memory might not be yours, right? So you cannot, you cannot be throttled according to who owns that memory that you're swapping. Um, otherwise, you might have the old priority inversions where you wait for a lower priority thing. So uh, what this thing, uh, thing does is uh, a concept called do first, pay later, where if there is memory reclaim, uh, you're going full throttle, you're using all the disk I.O., but then you charge whoever owned that memory that you swapped out. And when, when that guy tries to allocate later, he gets throttled, or when he submits more I.O. So it's a put on his budget, but you're still moving at full speed to avoid that priority inversion. Um, which brings us to that. So, yeah, that's a whole laundry list of things. Um, there's really no magic bullet. We just kind of had to go through one by one and fix these things up. Um, we switched to ButterFS to avoid the ext4 journaling issue. Um, and, um, and then inside ButterFS, there were a couple of things we had to untangle. Um, for the MEP semaphore, um, first we did... Um, the biggest offender was, uh, was uh, read-ahead, because every time you access a, a disk on file, it doesn't just read one page, the one thing you're looking at, because that'd be a waste of an IOP. You could do a lot more with a single IOP. So it just reads ahead a couple couple hundred K. Um, and if you're really heavily under memory pressure, it, it's not a good idea to try to allocate a couple hundred K and start IO when you're already just <laughs> maxed out on all the capacity. 
So we, um, we put a patch in to um, detect that situation and just abort read ahead and do page by page IO. Um, that helped uh, a lot, but it doesn't f um, uh, fully um, cover all the situations in which we still kind of had these hangs. So um, um, Joseph, who's not here, is also at, uh, uh, at Facebook. And I were working on um, completely avoiding any kind of IO under the MF semaphore, um, which is, uh, includes swap IO, um, page, page cache, which includes um, things um, like writing to a file in the file system, which has file system specific stuff. So it's kind of like slogging through all these things and uh, patching it up. And then uh, shared IOs, as I mentioned, uh, do first pay later, um, where if you're trying to reclaim, um, it goes at full speed, but if somebody else tries to allocate or try to uh, um, create more potentially um, uh, memory that needs to be swapped, that guy gets uh, throttled instead. Um, right, so how does this look in practice for us? Um, so the first thing, um, we have to switch the ext4 root file systems um, on our machines to ButterFS. And that was actually kind of funny because we, we brought this up in the meeting that we have a priority inversion here and we should consider switching to ButterFS. And um, the, the team that, that, has, that handles these things kind of uh, just took it and run with it. And after a couple of weeks, we had um, several hundred thousand machines converted to full on ButterFS rootFS, which uh, um, made our ButterFS developers sweat a little bit. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's been pretty solid, and uh, we have a seven-digit uh, container image now, all in ButterFS, and uh, it's, uh, it's running pretty well. Um, and um, yeah, all the priority inversions are being addressed. Um, all the metadata is, uh, is annotated and properly charged to, um, to handle these inversions. Um, uh, the other thing is uh, we pr uh, have swapped pretty much everywhere. Um, so. Some of our workloads, they're like 80, 90% anonymous memory. And if you get into trouble with that, there's not a lot of breathing room for the kernel if you don't have swap. Because that all that stuff is basically mlock. That's uh, everything you get from malloc, that's tempfs. Um, if you can't manage these and, and compress them or get them out of memory, you might be running OK in one second, and you might completely hit the wall in the next second, right? Because the the distance between being okay and being out of memory is very small if you can't manage memory. Um, the other thing is there's, there's always a competition between your file system caches and anonymous memory. And if you can't swap, then you might be thrashing your file system caches and constantly reload the same stuff while there might be anonymous memory that is completely unused. And you could just swap it once and be fine and, and um, the system would run a lot better. So having swap enables us to um, to do all this and m makes it much better for memory utilization. Um, the other thing that's uh, useful when you do this is um, as you get into pressure, instead of hitting that wall, um, it just kind of gracefully decreases the memory bandwidth and pressure builds up slowly until we hit what I mentioned earlier, that um, our tolerance for production um, capacity Right, so at some point, UMD will notice, oh, you're spending a lot of time swapping. That's something I recognize as a problem and just kill, uh, kill, kill the um, unmanageable workload. And uh, th this is really important because I think everybody remembers uh, how horrible swap can be. Um, because if it's fine, it's fine. And then sometimes the machine just goes out for lunch for minutes or hours. And uh, UMD is really the, tr the key here because it, it can detect exactly when this happens and it gives us all the upsides of swap and kicks in when things go haywire. Um, so we have swap en enabled pretty much everywhere except for the main workload, but that's only for right now because it really depends again what is the latency tolerance and right now the main workload's not really um, tolerating swap IO. Um, so the C group setup is kind of like this. We have uh, three major hierarchies. Um, one is um, the, the workload itself, obviously, um, where the, uh, the web server software sits. Um, then we have the, um, uh, the system slice, which holds um, all the, the, the package management and the remote control of the system, the monitoring, the logging. Um, and then we have something that's kind of in between called the host critical slice, which is neither the workload um, nor like um, that uh, lower priority stuff, because 
if that if the, if those um, binaries die, then the whole machine goes down. Something like SSHD, we detect and reboot the machine if it goes out. Um, we also want reliable logging. Uh, we want UMD to work at all times because uh, that saves our ass constantly. Um, and so this, these are kind of setups. So we have um, the host critical is the only one that has a hard guarantee because we'd rather k have um kill uh, go on and off on the host level than have any of these not be able to make forward progress. Then the workload gets the majority of the memory on these machines um, as a soft guarantee set by memory law. Um, and then you can see the, um, the IO latent guarantees. Um, workload and host critical have the highest priority and then system slice. Uh, is below that because it's less important. Um, UMD we configure in a way that um, we protect primarily we protect the workload from what's going on in the in the uh, lower priority uh, system maintenance stuff, um, and we also protect the system thing from itself. So if there's any kind of pre if there's moderate like. If there's mid-level pressure in the workload, we kill something in the system. If there's high pressure in the system, we kill something in the system. Um, uh, then we have triggers for I.O. as well, um, just to make sure uh, the workload gets the I.O. bandwidth it needs in order to function. Um, and we monitor swap right now um, to make sure that if we run out of swap real quick, then we also have to kill something. Um, yeah. So these are the users that uh, that uh, we are seeing. Uh, let me see. Oh yeah, that's the first one. So these are the hard, uh, hard drive machines, web servers running, you know, fully saturated. Um, so this is uh, 10 megabyte uh, per second memory leak uh, started in the you know in the management uh, part of the system, and um, on the green line, like the the new one, the Epitex to protected one, right? It gets started three times. You know, RPS drops a little bit. But you know, UMD kicks, you know, uh, memory protection and all the protections is working. So they are um, protecting workload while punishing uh, uh, the the memory leak. And then UMD eventually recognizes recognizes that the uh, you know the system is not in a healthy state and goes in and kills the memory memory uh, memory bomb. And um, as a comparison, right, the the base IPS just drops. The system just checks out, right? I mean, that line is not you know that straight line is not number being numbers not being reported, right? The system completely checked out. It stopped reporting anything. So like the the graph draw just you know draw straight straight line, and the system got rebooted and you know recovered after like half an hour. And this is a little bit faster memory leak, uh, 50 megabyte per second, about the same story, but you know the dips are kind of deeper and the timeline more compressed. But you know, same thing. And this is 100 megabyte per second. Even deeper dips, even faster timing, but the same thing. Uh, one thing really interesting in these graphs, I'm, I'm going to go, go to that uh, later, but is that uh, the, the top one, right, the, the green and the, the purple ones, are the RPS, the resulting performance of the system. And the bottom graphs, right, uh, these small things at the bottom, um, are memory pressure numbers. Um, and it's a lot more clear in the um, SSD cases, so I'm going to get that uh, get to that later. Um, yes, um, and this is uh, uh, I/O protection kicking in. So I just uh, we just started like um, uh, untarling a kernel package three times and touching them and removing them uh, in the management portion. So it's kind of simulating you know yum going haywire or something like that. Um, and the interesting thing is that uh, without the protection, the dips are deeper. I mean. Um, but you know, it also ends faster, right? Uh, the untarring the, the the bomb workload finishes faster because it consumes more uh, resources. That's uh, uh, that's expressed by those green bars, green, uh, green and purple bars. So green bar uh, shows that on the protected host, that bomb takes longer because you know its resources you know getting controlled. But also, you know, they are the main workload suffers suffers less. And uh, one of the interesting thing here is that. Even you know, even these are all protected. They are still showing like these dips, right? Especially on the um, hundred megabyte one, it's kind of clear. I mean, there's a fairly dip, dip, right? And the reason for that is because these are uh, nominally oversubscribed, so we cannot protect it too hard because um, system does like like uh, the system management actually needs to steal some I/O capacity temporarily from workload 
for the system to stay healthy because you know it's just oversubscribed normally because there's more efficient. So we cannot protect it kind of really strictly. That's why you know you see those dips. And going to the um, SSD, um, it gets a lot better. It's a kind of same same test, but on SSDs. And look, if you look at the green lines, you know they barely dip, right? I mean they still dip a little bit because the you know kernel needs to figure out what's working and what's not. But uh, you know those are like small dips. Nobody cares. Nobody would even get paged over that, right? It's completely fine. Everybody can sleep peacefully. Um, so you know basically same story, right? Um, unprotected, the system just dips. They recover faster because SSDs are awesome, but you know, still we don't want that, that kind of dip. But uh, look at, you know, uh, this one is less clear. But look at this one. So if you look at the bottom, right, um, these are like uh, really small peaks here and higher peaks there. So one thing really interesting is that the blue line, which has uh, like this medium peak, there's a memory pressure in system that slides. So there's a the memory pressure that the memory bomb and the rest of management things are experiencing. The, the small, like the tiny bump here is the memory pressure that workload slice is experiencing. So what, what's happening is that a uh, uh, kernel memory controller kicked in and, and made sure that you know, um, the workload is getting enough memory while punishing system that slice. Right? So it's biasing the uh, memory pressure that way to protect the workload. If you look at this, um, the green and orange lines, um, if they are still, you know, a little bit different because they are, you know, their behavior is different. But there's a system and workload for the unprotected system, and um, the pressure just kind of rises together, and the system crashes. Right? Um, no, nothing is being protected there. So yeah, that's the results. Um, and um, now that we have, so this um, is. I mean, this might not be you know, as exciting as, you know, yeah, we succeeded at you know, stacking multiple workloads and they all work perfectly. We are not there yet, but um, this does demonstrate that we now can protect or isolate resources comprehensively while maintaining like, full OS features. Um, so the, um, if you think about it, right, um, if you can protect your main workload from system management stuff, right, Nothing prevents you from like you know loading like a side workload, like a batch workload in the system that slice, and you know the system would be just be happy, right? Because it's fully protected. So that's uh, what we are gonna try next, um, um, pretty soon. This keeps sliding down, um, and so yeah, we're gonna try to lose some batch workload, uh, uh, you know, next to our main workload, and we'll try to make sure that you know workload is not disturbed at all. So that would be our next step towards uh, workload stacking. Uh, with you know full transparency, and eventually um, we we still need some features, especially on the iOS side. But you know we will uh, start experimenting with uh, you know uh, putting uh, heterogeneous workloads on a single system while fully controlling how resources are used across them without using utilization. So this um, was our on our to-do list. All right, um, and most of these features are already upstream. Some of them are not yet. Um, but like in, in, in the next version, next release, or the one after that, the kernel release, um, they should have everything, uh, should have everything uh, upstream. So you guys can use it the same way we use it. Um, and all of this uh, is documented on this website. You actually don't need uh, the, the hashtag now. We, we dropped that. So you can go to, I mean, it still works with hashtag, but it looks kind of worse. Um, you can go to opensource.fb.com slash Linux. And you know, it, lists, like, it has these icons. Um, and you know, there's a C group too, PSI, PPF, all these things. And then, you know, you can uh, go to the website, and there's a fair, fairly good quality documentation, so you can learn more details about them. All right, so that was it. Any questions? Yeah, out of time. Okay.